well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's Jonathan, and I'm David, and um, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to be on stage speaking with you and on this subject, which, you know, the title of this conversation is The Problem of Nature Writing. I think we're going to weave a little far afield from that as we talk, but just to start, um, what, John, what is the problem with nature writing? <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, too. Um, and many months ago, uh, I'd agreed to come here and um, said, you need to do a second event. Is there anybody you'd like to appear with? And I looked down the list, and I said, that guy. Because uh, I think uh, David is doing really, really good, nuanced reporting um, on arguably the biggest issue of our time. So it's great to be here, David. Uh, the problem of nature writing. <coughs> Simply put, we have another second very large thing happening, which is the sixth extinction, the ongoing um, killing of natural systems on the planet. Uh, ecosystems everywhere are in trouble, whether you look at groundwater, whether you look at habitat loss, whether you look at overfishing of the oceans, we have a huge problem. Um, and it would, and it is overshadowed by the climate problem. Why? Because in the perceived future, the, the effects of global warming are going to <coughs> heavily impact human lives. Whereas, so there are no more tuna, so there are no more krill uh, for penguins to eat in Antarctica. How does this really affect us? So it's understandable there's a politically, socially, culturally more attention given to the one major crisis, but there is this other crisis. And the problem there is that although those of us who are engaged with the natural world find it fascinating, um, joy bringing, uh, marvelous, endlessly uh, explorable and interesting, it's kind of boring to read about. <laughs> That's the problem of nature writing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, the, to my surprise, a, a little quasi-polemic that I published uh, in The New Yorker last summer, <clears throat> which was itself an introduction to an anthology of bird writings from a small magazine, um, is the title of our, our piece. And, it, and it, I say it was polemical because I was really reacting against wrong ways of writing about nature. The problem, another problem, if you care about the natural world, is we, it, it needs constituents. It needs people to care about it, too. There, there are 5% of us in the population who really, really, you know, the fact that we've lost a third of our songbirds in the last 50 years in the United States, third of the population, um, that's really alarming and important. And we love the birds, but 95% of the people at best, only casually care about that. Uh, and there is a way to, do, to, to write about those little warblers. They're fighting their way north from Colombia to nest in New England um, that talks about how beautiful they are and how joyous it is to be out looking at them. And it's really boring if you're not already converted. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. Just cutting to the chase, we can perhaps end my part of the conversation in the next 60 seconds, David. Uh, just cutting to the chase. Paradoxically, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna really try to interest someone who doesn't care about the natural world in the natural world, you need to foreground people because people, A, are interested in other people. Um, we are egotists in that way. We are species egotists. Um, but also B, because to, 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 to write something that people really want to read, or that the 95% who are not the hardcore 5% want to read, um, you actually have to tell a story. And stories are human. Uh, you, if I were to try to tell a story about a mockingbird, um, you know, I know some of the science of the mockingbird, and but but but, but the mockingbird has no, it has pretty basic desires, 
And those desires are instinctive. They're not individualized. And so you're, you're telling this kind of generic story about a bird that wants to eat and reproduce. Um, and kind of, you just go down the whole list of species everywhere, animal species certainly, but they all have the same desire. They want to eat and they want to reproduce. Well, we do too, but we have a lot more interesting things. Like we really, really want to score tickets to the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, and, and that kind of particularity of desire, that's a human thing. And my conclusion, and I don't think I'm giving that much away because it's only like an 1800 word piece, um, you get to that conclusion pretty quickly, is that paradoxically, if you want to write about nature, you need to write, you need to find a way in which you're telling a human story. And, that, and there you have sort of have two choices. You can tell about, in the realm of nonfiction, actually also sort of the realm of fiction, um, you can find an interesting character who cares about this thing and the thing about narration is the desire of any kind. When you read the sentence, Jim wanted that, there's this weird alchemical thing that happens for the reader. You start wanting that. You start wondering if Jim's gonna get what, what he wants. <laughs> uh, and when Jim is thwarted initially, you suffer with Jim because he's not getting what he wants, even though you don't want what Jim wants. That's, it's the weird thing about written narrative, and actually spoken narrative too, is that we, is the desire is really contagious. Um, so you can find a character who, who wants something, um, like is, I don't know, trying to find the last penguin on the Antarctic Peninsula or whatever. Um, and the other, the other choice you have is to write about yourself, um, because you know what you want. And, uh, and you can tell a complicated story about how you know what you want and you're not getting it. And there you go. That's my piece in a nutshell. And <laughs> I'm well, going to turn it around to David. Wait, can I just pick up on something? Yeah, please pick up. A few things up. you said. So um, the way that I see this, I'm, you know, I'm coming at a lot of these subjects from climate. So I, I write sometimes about biodiversity loss and conservation and the, the damage to the natural world. But I'm coming to it from, um, from a place focused primarily on climate change. Um, but I'm also someone who I think has done a lot of work and been part of a shift in writing about climate away from writing about the natural world and towards a focus on humans. And I think that's been a big part of the climate writing story over the last half decade or decade. I think it's also been a big part of the climate activism and advocacy story. You know, when I was a kid, I knew about climate change, but I thought about it in terms of polar bears. Um, now people who are you know, learning about it in elementary school or high school are thinking about it, not just in terms of impacts on humans, but um, you know, impacts filtered through um, lenses of you know social justice, and um, they're they're very much thinking about climate in those in those human terms. So I think fields of writing and thinking about these issues, which used to be quite moving quite in parallel, have kind of acquired different. Um, points of emphasis and, and, and scope over the last half decade or decade. And I think, you know, from a climate perspective, it's been, to your point, really powerful. I think that a lot more people are a lot more worried about climate than they were 20 years ago because they've been told, they've had the story narrated to them in terms of human impacts as opposed to um, natural impacts. But I think there's another thing that's also, that distinguishes these two you know, affiliated but in certain ways distinct fields or area of you know, modes of inquiry, modes of writing. And that is um, the question of timeline, which is to say um, so much of writing about climate change and particularly kind of like extreme climate impacts like a lot of the stuff that I've written about um, unfolds in a relatively distant future that can allow readers to imagine something of a real discontinuous break that sometime, maybe it's soon, maybe it's in a decade, maybe it's in the lifetime of our children, maybe it's just at the end of the century, who knows, but sometime relatively soon, the world's gonna look very different. Um, and that sort of narrative structure has a real power. Um, you know, it, it draws on apocalyptic strains that um, we all have sort of inside us. Um, I don't know how true it is. I think that, you know, we may make predictions for 2050 or 2070 or 2080 that come true, but they come true not through discontinuities, but through continuities. And I wonder a little bit about, you know, exactly how we should be 
telling those stories and describing those futures. And I think the example of nature writing here and conservation writing in particular is really illuminating because one challenge for someone who's trying to write what is both a kind of lamentation for um, the things we're losing and have lost and also a kind of an exhortation or work of naturalistic evangelism, which is, I think, one of the modes in which you've written on these issues. Um, one of the challenges is that so much has been lost already. And we all look around and think, maybe it's regrettable, maybe it's tragic, but also it's kind of fine. <laughs> and you, know, you, you mentioned that you know, songbirds have declined by 30%. We've seen larger declines in other animal areas. You know, I think a lot of insect studies say 70% um, over the course of um, your lifetime. Um, you know, we just across the board, you know, two thirds of animal species are in some amount of significant decline according to the Wild, World Wildlife Foundation. Those numbers are maybe not entirely reliable, but they give a shape to um, and, and a sense of scale of the decline of the natural world, um, as do data that we have that show that something like 95% of all mammal biomass on Earth is human and their livestock, and only 5% of it is actual, actually natural. Um, this is something I've thought about a fair amount. I'm, you know, I'm, I have two young daughters. I'm reading a lot of children's books to them, and it's like so many of these books are about animals in the <laughs> wild, and you're like, there aren't any animals in the wild anymore. Yeah. There, there are animals on farms, and there are children's books about that too. But, um, but you know, we, we are already, you know, when we talk about the sixth extinction, um, you know, and 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 the mass extinction that we're we're all living through, I think it's important to keep in mind and remember and think about what it means that we are actually living through it. In fact, to some extent, have already lived through it, and it puts us in a bit of a narrative bind. However, we want to talk about those issues because whatever we are warning about or worrying over or even trying to make meaning out of is something which our culture and our politics and all of us individually have to some degree already processed. And by that I mean processed into background noise. Um, how do you think about that challenge of the timeline of decline, where we are in these stories and what it demands of us or the challenges it poses to us as storytellers in trying to communicate um, to a broader audience. It's interesting you say that we, we are, you know, we, we, I've been driving around the Palm Springs, greater Palm Springs area, and everything looks normal. <coughs> um, lots of cars, um, not that many hybrids that I've noticed, actually, uh, and maybe it's different here in Rancho Mirage. Um, <coughs> but, uh, you know, we are we are asked to use our apocalyptic imagination and uh, imagine the Blade Runner way this thing is going to look in fifty years, um, and uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I would I would say two things. One is that when I look at the bad sequelae of unchecked global mean temperature rise over the next decades, I see it almost exclusively in social, political, and geopolitical terms. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I think the, the the issue of climate migration, climate immigration, um, which we're already seeing in play in Europe and in our own country, um, and to see what that, and to see what the pressure, the perceived, even the perceived pressure, and also if you have a narrative of things are gonna get much worse, instead of 10 million people trying to um, get into the country, uh, you have 100 million or 500 million, um, that has this, rather pronounced effect on our politics. Um, it's no accident that at the heart of Trumpism is the issue of immigration. And it's also not completely crazy because, because this is going to be a problem. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, it's, not even, it's not even the natural systems that I worry about so much. Um, yes, it'll, especially, well, I have the luxury of that. I don't live in uh, Saharan Africa. Um, it would be existential in terms of rising temperatures there here in North America, maybe not so much. 
Um, just to briefly jump in on that, just to, you know, in the Sahel, which is the area across the, across the African continent, um, you know, sub-Saharan, just sub-Saharan, um, you know, we've had over the last three years what is now being routinely called a coup belt because there have been attempted and successful coups in every single country stretching across the continent. Um, and, you know, there have been, for, I mean, as, soon, as long as I've been writing and thinking about climate, this is the region of the world where people said, that was people said where most, there were politics where it was most vulnerable to um, climate disruption. Each of these countries has had really significant natural disasters, some of them more extreme and obviously climate supercharged and others more normal. Um, but nevertheless, each of them have been dealing with um, real challenges from the natural world. And very, yet we're not really talking about that phenomena, the coup belt, the fact that these seven countries have had successful coups, I think 13 unsuccessful ones um, since 2020. Um, we're not talking about that as a climate phenomenon. We've actually sort of like shelved the climate part of it um, and are talking about it simply as a geopolitical phenomenon, which is, um, I think, a parallel story to the way that we talk about immigration, where we maybe occasionally you hear about climate factors in, um, in this or that immigration surge, but generally we, we talk about it completely independent of its, of its climate impact. And yeah, there's, there's some dissonance there, there's some delusion there, but I think it, both cases tell us that in many human stories, many dramatic human stories in the present age, climate is there in the background, maybe even um, quite powerfully acting and not something that we can write out of the story. It has to be sort of integrated and incorporated, especially if we hope to, to make a, a sort of systematic or thorough reckoning with, with the phenomenon itself. Exactly. Um, the, the, the other point I wanted to make was that um, when, you, when you tell a story of the world in flames and um, civil wars and regional armed conflicts some years down the line, all driven by rising temperatures um, uh, and things related to that, like water shortages, um, you're, you're, you're essentially like, what's the purpose of that narrative? What, what is that narrative trying to achieve? That narrative, it seems to me, is largely trying to reach an audience and scare them um, with, the, with the intention of, if people are scared enough, they'll take this threat more seriously and that will affect their daily behavior, that will affect their political behavior. Um, uh, and my issue for some time has been that fear is maybe not the best motivator because uh, well, it, 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 first of all, um, again, my apologies to, I know this is not a politically homogenous group, but I think that the, the fear of migrants, um, that, that has kind of like a, that's maybe not the, the result you want, um, just in terms, in political terms, if you're a, a, a liberal or a progressive, you, you would like it not to translate into, um, into <clears throat> a cruel and heavy-handed border policy. You'd actually, you're hoping it means more people will buy more sensible vehicles and ride their bicycles to work. But in fact, the fear Fear is this really primal instinct, and the, and you have and when you when you feel fear, you you kind of clench up and you don't may, maybe make the best choices. Um, so, and 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 I think that the the, the the realm of apocalyptic fiction, the realm of apocalyptic projections, um, it's important to have it noted. These are likely consequences if we don't rein in our carbon emissions, and there's very little evidence that we will sufficiently to make much of a difference. It's important to have that noted, but I don't actually think that those are narratives you need to hear more than a couple of times. Um, in the same way that when I was growing up, the big, understandably, there were a lot of thermonuclear warheads aimed at my country, um, uh, enough to exterminate basically vertebrate life on Earth if they all went off. Um, 
it's like, and I got that, I internalized that somewhere around age 12, 13, and I was terrified, uh, and in fact had some serious doubts about whether I'd live to 25. Uh, and it's kind of lucky <coughs> that it, we haven't used those weapons, but it's by no means certain that we never will. Um, but I didn't need to keep on reading it in a way. It's like I got the message. And then what? Then actually, how do you, how do you create a world in which that's a less likely outcome? Um, and so the, the, the purpose of the narrative needs to actually, you, 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 the, the narrative has to offer in some fashion either hope or a plan of meaningful action. Um, and riding your bike to work is not, uh, sad to say, meaningful action. <laughs> um, well, I have a few things I want to follow up there. And We're supposed about. to be having a conversation. Uh -huh. We're doing this without notes. We will please pat us on the back for that. <laughs> um, but just very quickly, in retrospect, do you wish that you had not thought so much about thermonuclear war? Do you think that it was overhyped? Do you think the world would be a better and healthier place if less anxiety had been um, stirred up about it? No, in fact, actually. I think people are not scared enough about it even now. Um, I, I, I was made fun of, actually, for putting a missing nuclear warhead in one of my novels. Um, but that's to say, uh, complete aside, if, if, if you haven't read Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control, that's a good way to get, um, get scared again. That's Eric Schlosser of <laughs> Fast Food Nation. And he, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. He's a great writer. And it basically is <laughs> talking about all the times we came rather close to thermonuclear war owing to the impossibility of effective control systems for the nuclear arsenal. And that's in a pretty well-run country. Um, so I, I think people, more people should be afraid of it. And, and there was a time, I mean, people were afraid after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I do think that had a palpable uh, effect on choices. And it led to strategic arms limitation talks and all of those things. Um, and in, in, it led to treaties, which Russia is about to let expire and so forth. Like, I do think it's important to keep that front and center. And because there is actually something we can do about that. <laughs> um, that's a threat that we, that it is, it is within human power to radically reduce. Um, and historically, which is to say for the last 10 years, I've had a bit of a beef with the fact that the apocalypse narratives have been so completely taken over by, cli by climate, um, essentially. And, and, the, and just to finish the thought, one of my points is that when it comes to uh, biodiversity loss, there are, again, practical steps that you can do even at the local level to reverse that. Um, and, and so I'm looking for narratives that actually say, hey, you know what? This is bad, but nature is resilient, and there's still things we can do about it. Um, so I want to ask you about the question of hope um, in a minute, but just a few things um, that you've mentioned in the last couple of minutes I wanted to pick up on, mm. too. One is, you know, just I happen, I mean, climate apocalypse narratives have certainly grown in centrality and importance in our culture. I think there's no denying it. But when I look around, I see apocalypse narratives almost everywhere. I, you know, I've, I've had the disorienting experience. I mean, I'm, I'm often described as a climate alarmist. Some people say some of my writing has been apocalyptic. Probably that's not totally unfair. I've also written other kinds of pieces, but, you know, it's, it's a fair um, note about some things I've written. Um, but, you know, I've had the experience of being told or hearing, reading um, folks saying that people, you know, people are too worried about climate for a while, and then watching a number of them really freak out about the existential risk from AI, like a lot of the same people. Um, I mean, it's literally like a, you know, a thing that people do in, in the Bay Area now, where you go around and like, as a matter of small talk, ask, ask each other what your probability assessments of human extinction at the hands of AI is. And um, 
you know, I think there are big questions about AI. I think it's an important thing we need to be reckoning with. But um, to hear from so many people who are so dismissive of dramatic changes in the natural world on which we all depend, um, even just a few years ago, now talking very casually and comfortably about, to, to my mind, a much more imaginary apocalypse scenario um, is really quite remarkable. I see it in the way that um, evangelical Americans um, talk about Trump as a, a, a kind of a, um, you know, a kind of a savior figure, despite all of his, um, you know, obvious non-evangelical <laughs> attributes. Um, you know, I, I just see I see quite a lot of beyond beyond the, the question of decline, which is its own cultural narrative that has a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, weight at the moment. Um, I do actually see apocalypse narratives almost everywhere, not just around climate. And I think that the bi one bigger question is why we are telling so many of these stories, which may reflect deep, real concerns and challenges, may express hard, you know, um, genuine moral, ethical dilemmas that we all of us should be reckoning with much more than we are. In a certain sense, they're 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 doing important consciousness raising work. But why we're choosing to tell so many of them in such such apocalyptic terms, and climate is one of the examples there. But I think, to me at least, it's not the only one. But when I think about the question of climate and fear, um, I I think there's a lot more that we can get out of that than you're, than you're suggesting. I mean, when I think about um, you know, the last five years, um, I, I, my, my book came out in early 2019, but I finished it in the fall of 2018. You know, nobody knew who Greta Thunberg was in the fall of 2018. Um, she was a, literally a lonely, friendless teenager with a single sign sitting outside of Swedish parliament. Um, over the course of just a few months, she had become the global face of a climate youth climate movement inspired over the next year or two, millions of people all around the world, many of them under the age of 18, many of them not in democratic um, countries, many of them ethnic minorities, queer, you know, young women. In other words, people who are, could not be farther from the halls of global power to try to seize some political opportunity and make their voices heard. Um, you saw organizations like Extinction Rebellion in the UK and Sunrise in the US either be founded or grow dramatically and raise the level of climate alarm somewhat considerably. So these are people who are both in groups of which I get, you could group me to some degree, um, both channeling some of the apocalyptic and alarmist energy that you're describing and contributing to it. And there are certainly downsides to that and risks, but when I look at the state of climate politics and climate consciousness all around the world, I see that as a quite positive contribution. Um, if I ran, if we ran back the clock and said, we're not gonna be freaking out about two degrees and 1.5 degrees, we're not gonna, you know, Greta's not gonna be giving those speeches at Davos, um, Extinction Rebellion's not gonna be shutting down, um, you know, big squares in London and all the way down the line, you know, Sunrise isn't gonna be harassing Joe Manchin. Um, I think, I think that we'd be in a worse place um, for climate politics than we are now. And that's not to say that fear or apocalypticism is the only way to tell these stories, or even the most effective way at a broad level. It's just to say that um, we are all complicated people, the story is very complicated, and I think to move away from fear or to be scared of fear when many of the impacts of climate change are genuinely scary is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more a matter of the fungibility of fear that I'm concerned about. Um, the, 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 and, and it goes to your point about most of these narratives are future narratives. So you are being asked not to worry about some imminent real threat to you, the people you love. You're asked to worry about a possible threat 10 or 20 years in the future, or if you have children, a threat to your children or your grandchildren. Um, and, and the thing is, when you push it out just a decade or two, <laughs> terrible things are gonna happen. Well, there's another terrible thing that everyone knows is gonna happen not that many decades from now, which is you're gonna be dead. <laughs> and, and we all, most of us, have had moments in our lives where we think about the prospect of being dead 
forever. And it's really, really scary. And, and, and yes, if you are a Flannery O'Connor type of Catholic, you want, or a Muriel Spark type of Catholic, you want to keep that consciousness, that memento mori with you every day and you want it to inform everything you do. But for most of us, things, you, you, you have a moment of fear, this is terrible, but there are a whole lot of things that are terrible that are gonna happen in the future. And it doesn't, I just feel like it, it does lose its bite at a psychological level because you wake up in a panic in the middle of the night, oh my God, the world's gonna go up in flames. And you, and, or you, you allow in the fact that this is probably, in a human scale, irreversible and really terrible what we're doing to the atmosphere. You let that in, you feel terrible about it, you feel grief and personal fear, fear on behalf of others. But then where do you go with that? It's like we're equipped to, <laughs> to recognize intellectually all these terrible things that are gonna happen in the future, with death being number one. Um, and we're also equipped psychologically to just continue going about our lives. Well, I mean, on some level, I think of some of the fear narratives as being a way of countering that normalization. Um, so when I think about, one, uh, one of the reasons I think it's valuable to talk in stark terms about aspects of the world that we expect to see in say 2050 or 20, even 2030, it's because if we wait until 2049 or 2029 to experiencing them, we will have gotten used to things quite like those impacts. Right. And um, being shown the scale of change from a distance, it, is, it can be scary and disorienting. It also, I think, often underplays the degree to which, you know, you talked earlier about the fragility of human response to some of these challenges, but there's also some adaptability and resilience. And I think often we, when we, when we talk about climate futures, we underplay that. But nevertheless, um, it's important to say here's where we're heading at a 10-year timeline or a 30-year timeline for me, because if we don't, we're just gonna sleepwalk our way into it. And I think about, you know, we just had this, um, it's often called a wildfire. It actually wasn't a wildfire. It's, it was an urban firestorm that swept through Lahaina in, in Maui, produced the deadliest fire um, in the US in over 100 years. That was this past summer. And there was news coverage of it, and people talked about it. But it passed into, the, you know, into kind of the background. It became a part of our wallpaper um, relatively quickly, within a week or two. And similar, I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you, there, there are millions of things, <laughs> millions of tragedies and, and, and disasters that are happening all the time. No, but let's talk a little about fire. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was, lived very, very close to the CZU fire in 2020, uh, the bad summer of 2020. Um, there's a wonderful new book about that just published by a woman named Manjula Martin um, called The Last Fire Season. Look for it. Uh, if, you've, if you've lived in the neighborhood of fire in California, you'll, I think you might appreciate how she captures what it's, what it's like, including in, for us in the north, the apocalyptic day when there was no sun, when there, it was just like a total eclipse all day because of the smoke, and no smell of smoke, because it was at such a high level. Um, but the response, <laughs> I had to laugh at the response. So there were two responses. There was then President Trump saying, uh, climate's gonna rebound to, for the better, just, just you watch. Um, and anyway, this is, not, this is not, these fires, that massive, however many um, millions of acres it was, six, eight million acres just in the summer of 2020, the fire season, um, that's, that, y you're politicizing it to talk about climate, that's the result of poor forest management. Um, it okay. Is, it is both. <laughs> exactly, it is both. And it's a century of fire suppression that is the frontline problem there. What does Gavin Newsom say in his announcement? These fires are terrible, we're gonna have all electric fleet of vehicles in California in 2035. It's like, 
good, good, but he, he can't admit, he can't admit in his press conference, in his public remarks, that there's a forest management problem too, a fire management problem, a ghastly century long fire management problem, um, because Trump already said that. So he can't say that. So you're looking at like, okay, good, in 2035, we'll be doing our little 1% or 2% of the world bit to reduce carbon emissions after continuing to put them out for 15 years in the meantime, never mind that. Um, it's like, dude, there's a lot of highly flammable stuff in the forests. Why not get up and say, we're worried about next year, and, we're, and I want $100 billion to work on the problem right in front of us that is, you know, yes, climate is going to make fires hotter and the land drier, but, but there's, a, there's a big problem that you're not looking at because you're so focused on the future. That's kind of where I'm, that's, that's my, there's my a, writer's there, creed in a nutshell that there's, little There's a third terrible. problem also, which is just about development, which is to say like I yeah, think the, half of all Californian homes built since 1990 are built in high fire risk areas. Um, and so it's not just that there's more land burning and more smoke in the air, it's also the fact that Presumably, we're going to be having many more interactions with fire um, in our suburban Like what happened in Santa Rosa yeah. and things yeah. like that. in Paradise, yeah. Although, yeah, although Santa Rosa, that was like here. Yeah. And it's still, the, the fire took out, and I don't know how many people were killed, but it just looked, took out an entire neighborhood in 20 minutes. Well, this, I mean, it's, it's an increasing phenomenon. In Santa Rosa was actually really the first that some climate scientists called the return of the urban firestorm. So... This is the, what we used to see, like it's what the Great Chicago Fire was, it's what the Great London Fire was, where you know, fires burn through dense, settled areas by burning the human-made structures, not by burning trees. And it happened in Santa Rosa, it happened um, in Paradise, it happened in Boulder, Colorado, it, it happened a couple times, it happens a couple times in Canada, and it's what happened in, in Maui. And you know, some of these have to do with um, the intensity of the fires, which has a climate aspect, they burn hotter, they burn larger. Bigger um, winds, yeah. But it also has to do with where we put our homes and what we're building them out of. But even homes that were built to be fire resilient based on the standards that fires themselves set a generation ago are now much less fire resistant because the fires burn so much hotter. And um, so, you know, all of these things are, are coming together I, I, and the factors are varied. Um, but if climate is making the challenge larger, that means that all the things we have to do in all the other areas are kind of more urgent. Um, you know. Right, and I was, I, was, I, was, I was just pointing, Gavin Newsom has many fine qualities, <laughs> um, I think. Uh, <laughs> I assume. Uh, it, was, it was this, it was the dominance by a single narrative in his response. Um, and when I think we have, as you say, in this instance, there were three narratives that needed attention. And indeed, it kind of intersects with um, the lack of affordable housing uh, in California, yep. which gets into a whole other realm, uh, <clears throat> um, well covered by your colleague uh, at the Times, Connor Doherty. Um, Another book I'm going to recommend, Golden Gates. If you want to read a good book about housing in California, um, wonderfully well written, came out four years ago now, Golden Gates, Connor Doherty. Um, it's, it's so, <laughs> I'm kind of repeating myself, but I think my, my concern is that you have this sort of narrative monoculture in which everything can be traced back to climate, and there's a real political edge to that. It's serving interests, political interests, and also, of course, potentially serving the future of humanity, um, that, we, that we downplay other narratives and we foreground this single narrative when, in fact, many of the problems we have, many of the problems we will continue to have and that will be exacerbated 
have nothing to do with climate. They're just, they're old human problems. And, and they're in the here and now. Um, so that's, I, 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 w I want them to be, I want them to be equal partners in the cultural conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes worry, wonder about just how clearly most people who are not deeply engaged in these questions, how distinct these stories really are to them. Because I, I have to say, like, half of the normies who talk to me about climate change will talk about, like, plastic pollution. And it's like, well, that's not climate change. <laughs> um, but, but in their mind, they process it in the same bundle because... It's helping, because you're burying the plastic. That carbon is not going to go anywhere. That's not going in the atmosphere. It's accumulating in the ocean. Good. <laughs> Although, I, another thing people, most people don't appreciate is that pl the plastic industry is a sort of um, subset of the petrochemical industry, so it's, it is all also related. But um, in any event, I think that there is a, you know, there's a way in which these things are distinct, and then there's a way in which they play together and braid together in people's minds. And to the extent that there is more you know, intuitive, emotional, reflexive, um, public sense that, that um, the way we are living is out of balance and the way that, the, um, the way that we are, you know, maybe some of that is personal guilt but also some sense of social guilt. Um, I think that, you know, these things can maybe be more complementary out in the world than they seem when you're reading the, the books next to each other. Um, but we just have a couple minutes left and I wanted to close on the question of Hope and optimism, which you mentioned um, somewhat earlier, which is you know in talking about the the limits of the problems with fear-based messaging and the limits of, of fear narratives, you said you know we want, we want to give people some hope, but you've also written like some quite despairing pieces about um, <laughs> the the state of the climate future, the state of the natural world, you know the state of the um, state of biodiversity. Um, I don't think that most people reading those pieces would say you know. Oh, John's really peddling like the, the hopeful message here. That's not to say that it's you know um, totally defeatist or nihilistic, but um, you're working, you know, you're balancing these things in your own work too. Um, and it seems to me at certain times you've been more focused on the bleak sides of the story. Um, how do you, how would you tell, if you care to tell, um, that narrative from you know? of your own writing and thinking about the question and importance of hope um, and how it may or may not need to be balanced against our individual but also collective impulse towards um, doom. You have, uh, you have one minute and 52 seconds. Um, I, I confess to being somewhat pessimistic about human nature um, and uh, and I think for rather sound reasons to be extremely pessimistic that the world can take enough global action um, to meet any of the, the climate goals that <clears throat> the elite has proposed as necessary. Um, and, and yet I'm not from day to day uh, a pessimistic person. I'm, I, I have all sorts of hopes. Um, and uh, quickly, now minute and five seconds. Um, in, in my last piece about climate, I proposed that it was, that hope is a kind of investment and that it makes sense to have a balanced portfolio. Uh, <coughs> investing 101, and that while, yes, it's important to fight against these apocalyptic scenarios uh, 20, 50 years down the line, it's also important to have more local and more personal things to hope for. And more immediate. And more immediate, exactly, that make an immediate difference. And that is, and, and some of that comes out from my, from my engagement with conservation, I have seen that if you actually put a little bit of money and quite a bit of work into solving a, a local small problem, you can actually help. Um, and I'm watching it tick. To I'm supposed to be watching that. You're supposed to be lecturing. But it's in my, <laughs> David, it's in my line of sight. Um, what do you think about hope? We're going to go 
a few seconds over to give David uh, a chance you know, to I guess answer I, his own question. Per, I guess at, at the most basic level, I think that many of these categories are misleading because everything's it's all mixed together. Yeah. And um, you know, it's funny, I've noticed just recently, a lot of people have been calling me an optimist because I happen to have written a few pieces off of my book and previous writing saying things are looking a little less grim than I thought they were. And I guess that's a move towards optimism and hope, but it's also from a very bleak baseline, and it's quite complicated to wrestle through what that means. And I often imagine on, on panels like this and you know, um, in essays and op-eds, um, people talk about these things as such clear categories of feeling when, of course, anyone who's open to the changes we're seeing in the world can feel within minutes of one, of it, of one after the other, panic, awe, um, compassion, tragedy, um, anger, um, you know, sense of resilience, and all of these things are all mixed together. And trying to sort of pre-program or pre-coordinate exactly what our message should be or calibrate our own emotional, um, where we should be emotionally about it, I think is really tricky. I think it's one reason why one of the things that people ask me most in settings like this is essentially, how should I feel about all this? Because it's really confusing. Um, I start from a really big picture perspective that the world is already warmer than it's ever been in all of human history, and that makes the future look like a really dangerous and scary experiment. I don't think that it's going to doom all of us. I don't even think it's gonna doom all of us to um, you know, miserable lives, let alone no lives. Like, but I do think that it will be shaping our lives in really big ways. I think it will be shaping the lives of all living things um, beyond the changes that have ever been seen by humans walking around on this earth before. And the fact that we are alive at that time is in certain ways a horror. It's also an incredible privilege both because it allows us to do some things to make small changes, and also because we just happen to be witness to the great story. On some level, it's the great story of humanity, the changes that this species has wrought on this planet. Um, it's a destructive story. It's an um, amazing story in many other ways. Um, but I think about these questions less in terms of um, you know, how any one person should think at any one time, and more in terms of um, just the largeness and complexity of the awesome narrative that we're all living in, perceiving, and participating in. And my main note to anyone who's thinking about this for the first time is just to try to keep your mind and your brain, your eyes open to the full scale and scope of that narrative. Yeah. <laughs>